verses 1 through 6, the word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause you to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and there he was, making something at the wheel. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter, so he made it again into another vessel, as it seemed good to the potter to make. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter? Says the Lord, Look as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. <clears throat> Once again, it's so good to be able to come back out and be with each and every one of you. It's always a pleasure. It's always edifying and uplifting to come together to study God's Word and to be built back up. So good to see each and every one of you out here this morning. We hope that as we go through the lesson this morning, it will be edifying to you and, and will be beneficial to all of us. I'm always amazed at just how, how much God knows us and how well God knows the way to get a point across to each and every one of us. It's amazing that of the, the visual examples that God uses when He tries to teach us a spiritual point by using something just as physical as a piece of clay. When he talks to Jeremiah here, he tells Jeremiah that he can do with Israel what the potter can do with a piece of clay. I find it interesting when you think about just what a piece of clay is, especially a piece of clay that's just left alone and, and if it's just uh, unshapen, that's basically all it is, just, just a, a raw mold, a raw shape, never meeting its full potential. What God tells us here in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 18, however, is that there's something about God that He can do in our lives that is extraordinary just as a skilled craftsman, a skilled sculptor can do with just a simple piece of clay and shape it into something that is far much more attractive, something that's far much more useful and beneficial to each and every one of us. We've been talking about a series of lessons now on what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. We've been talking about the what it looks like to be a disciple. We've looked at the idea of the, that it looks like the commitment of an athlete. We've talked about how that it, it looks like the strength, the intensity, and the training of a soldier. This morning, I want us to think about the clay. There's a picture the Bible gives, as, as we just read a moment ago in the book of Jeremiah, that we are like clay in the hands of the potter who is God. There's a couple of quotes that have been attributed to Michelangelo, not the Ninja Turtle, for our young folks. Michelangelo, the sculptor, the painter, from uh, the times of the Renaissance. Michelangelo was famous for being able to, to sculpt these marvelous, uh, various different things. He made the, the famous uh, statue of David out of marble. He painted the roof of the Sistine Chapel. But there's a couple of quotes that, were, that, that have been associated with him that I think uh, really tie in to the message this morning. One of the quotes that he made was that the sculpture is already complete within the marble block before I start my work. It is already there. I just have to chisel away the superfluous material. Another uh, quote of his says, Every block of stone has a statue inside it, and it is the task of the sculptor to discover. When I think about those two quotes, obviously they're not inspired of God, but I think just as God used the potter in Jeremiah 18, we can think about what Michelangelo said here, in that every single one of us, within every single one of us, there's a soul. And that soul has the potential to be something so much more. When we choose to be a disciple of Christ, and we choose to follow Him, and let Christ work on us in our lives, He's able to take away those layers. He's able to chip away those uh, pieces of stone in our lives that don't belong there. He's able to make us into something far more useful, something far more meaningful, something, with, something that is far more purposeful. You see, when we think about God, we think about His Word. The Bible tells us in Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 6, that God is the potter. And he said in verse 6, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter, says the Lord? Look, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. 
One of the things that we learn when we think about God, we think about how that, that God is in control of everything and that God is the potter, we learn that, that if we allow God to work on us in our lives, we can take, He can take us who were unmolded, shapeless pieces of clay, turn us into something that's far more beautiful, something far more useful, something that is a lot more pleasant than some unshaped piece of clay. I was going to give this to Angie, but she doesn't like touching Play-Doh, so we're going to just take one of this. Within each and every one of us, there's potential. What we have to understand is that God is that potter. God is that sculptor in our lives, and if we learn from that and understand that, we can be the kind of people He wants us to be. Now, the choice is ours. There's a choice that each and every one of us make in our lives to, to whether we let God be that sculptor in our lives, or whether we let him uh, just, just to sit on the side and we find ourselves off to ourselves, and we get to the end of our lives, we've never met our full potential. We've never been the kind of person that we wanted to be, more so the person that God wants us to be, and we find ourselves at the end of our lives just a useless, hardened lump of clay that never met his potential. The Bible tells us over in the book of Romans, chapter 9, verse 20 and verse 21, he says, But indeed, O man, who are you to reply against God? Will the thing formed say to him who formed it, Why have you made me like this? Does not the potter have power over the clay from the same lump that makes one vessel for honor and another for dishonor? And so here, Paul uses this same analogy when it comes to the idea of, of clay and a potter. And what he's reminding us is, 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 as I said a moment ago, God is that potter in our lives, and like, like, the, like the great sculptor that is able to take a piece of clay and sit it on the wheel and turn that clay around and mold it into what he wants it to be, God is able to do that with our lives. Spiritually speaking, he can take you who may be a broken individual who thinks that you have no purpose in life, who thinks that you're going down a path in this life and you don't know where it is that you're going to end up at. If you let God put you in his hands... He can sculpt you, and He can make you, and He can make you into the person uh, that you would love to be, that you love to be, and can give Him the glory. And we don't have to worry about questioning that. Notice here, Paul says the idea, would the thing form say to Him before me, why have you made me like this? And so the thing is, is we understand that if we're going to let God, if we let God be that sculptor in our lives and mold us, we don't have any right to question the Creator. The thing that's formed, whether it be a cup or whether it be a vase or whatever, doesn't have a right to say to the person that made it, why would you make me like this? The thing is, God knows our capabilities. God knows what we are capable of, and He is able to help us to meet and to exceed those capabilities in our lives. The book of Psalms puts it this way. Psalm chapter 139, verse 16, Your eyes saw my substance, being yet unformed. And in your book they all were written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. I find it amazing. When you think about the potential that each and every one of us has in our lives, God already knows what that potential is. Before we're even born into this world, God, as the supreme being in this world, knows what you're capable of. Even before your days were on this earth, He knows what you can do once you come out of that womb, the, the person that you can be. Just imagine, think about God. If we understand that God created this universe, if God can speak this entire universe into existence and make it look as beautiful as we know that it does, imagine what He can do with each and every one of us. You don't have to imagine it, though. You can make the choice to serve God and let God work in your life, and He can be the person, or rather you can be the person that He wants you to be. So let us understand as disciples, if God is the potter, we are the clay. So let's think about that for a moment here. Again, think about Romans chapter 9 and verse 20 when Paul said, But indeed, O man, that's you and me, who will reply against God? That's the creator, that's the potter. Will a thing form, that's us, say to him who formed it, God, why have you made me like this? Does not the potter, who is God, have power over the clay, that's us, with the same lump to make, to make a vessel for honor and another vessel for dishonor? And so we have to understand, if we're going to make, meet that potential that we want God to help us to get to, if we want God to shape us in our lives, and we want to find that purpose in our lives, and we want to find uh, and become that person that can give God all the glory, there's some things we want to have to have. You see, in order for a potter to be able to make 
clay shaped like a statue or in order to, to be able to form something the way that it's meant to be formed and to be formed in a very efficient way, something has to be uh, involved in that material. Material has to have certain ingredients in it. There's some things about the clay that, it, that has to be in it so that it can be malleable, so that it can be formed, so that it can be shapen. The Bible sometimes talks about the heart of an individual as a, being a hard heart or a soft heart or a good and honest heart, in other words. And so what our heart and the condition of our heart, our outlook on things, really affects the kind of clay that we are or are not in, in our lives. We need to have faith. We need to have faith that God's way is the right way, that God's way is the best way. We talked a lot about that this morning in our Bible study when we talked about Abraham and some of the mistakes that he made along the way and that he strayed away from, from God's plan. But let us understand that if we truly want to find joy in this life and be the kind of person that we are, want to be, but most importantly what God can make us to be, let us have faith. Let's have faith that His way is the right way. Now we make that leap of faith by choosing to follow Him, to pick it up by picking up our Bibles. I think about the mold that an individual might take, that whether it be that they're, they're making something like, say for instance, uh, cookies on a pan that are shaped differently. They stick that mold on there and it comes out whatever the shape it was. I think about God's Word and I picture it myself the Bible being opened. And I picture his word going onto me and me going through it as it's teaching me in my life. And I come out the other side shaped differently than I started. And so I have to have faith, though, that God can do that for me. I have to have faith that his word can do that for me. And I also have to humble myself in order to allow him to do that for me. I have to have humility. Humility that, that I'm willing to submit myself meekly to his will. So that it can shape me. James chapter 1 and, and verse 21 talks about how that we are to receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save our souls. We have to receive that mold, if you will, that, that shaping material uh, of God's hands and his word that he works on us with so that we can be shaped into an individual who is able to, to serve Him obediently in our lives. And so we need to have a fourth aspect. We have to have faith, humility, meekness, and obedience. Obedience that we are willing to obey God, do what He says, follow His Word, be workers of His, teaching others His Word, setting that example in our lives. And, and then what happens is, is we can become shapen the way that God wants us to be shapen. So Paul puts it this way in Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. I think it's interesting when you think about the idea that if, if we are going to be disciples of Jesus, that means we're following Him or we're listening to Him, we're walking in His footsteps, and more and more we're trying to be like Him. And if we are the clay that we want God to shape in our life, we have to present ourselves to Him as that clay. We have to make a choice to submit ourselves to God. You see, He gives us that choice. And so we, we make the choice to sit down on that wheel that the potter uses and allow God to take His hands upon us and allow Him to shape us in our lives. And that teaching of His Word is what does that. His teaching. And we, as He says here, you present your bodies a living sacrifice holy, or in other words, pure, acceptable to God. And so what that means is, is we need to be acceptable material. And so what I need to do is I need to take that, those layers and all those different things that can cause the ingredients of, of that clay mixture to be impure. I need to get those out of my life. I'm going to do that, of course, by serving God. And there's nothing unreasonable about that. Notice Paul says, which is your reasonable service. Is it unreasonable to serve God? No. It's not. Is there anything unreasonable about letting God shape us into the kind of person that can someday stand before Jesus and hear those words, well done, my good and faithful servant. And that's what it's all about. That's what we're striving to get to. There's nothing unreasonable about that. And so the next scripture Paul says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove 
what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God? <coughs> what happens if I am conformed? If I'm conformed, that means that I had, maybe I wasn't shaping, but then I'm put into some kind of mold, I'm put into some kind of shape, and I come out the other side, and I, maybe I look like everything else. Remember that? Remember the movie uh, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade? Maybe you don't, but there's a particular scene in that movie where Indiana Jones is breaking into the castle to save his dad. He breaks in, he, fly, he uses a rope, goes into this room, and his dad doesn't know it's him yet. He picks up this vase and he hits him in the head with it, and the vase cracks. I want his dad to throw out a piece. Sean Connery's that actor. Sean Connery uh, is sitting there, and he's like stressed out over that vase. How it was cracked because he thought it was an expensive-looking vase. He thought it was some kind of rare thing, and then, uh, and then after Indiana Jones finally comes to his senses and gets up off the floor, his dad looks over at him and says, "Look, it says it's made in China. It's a fake." <laughs> Then he just tosses it into the floor. Sometimes you can go and you can find some kind of expensive pottery or what you might think is expensive. But it's, it's, it's a fake because it, it looks that way. And we don't want to find ourselves being conformed to this world and looking like the rest of this world. Or saying that we're a Christian when in reality, inside, we're not. We need to let God shape us. We need to let God mold us. And so he says, do not be conformed to this world. To be conformed then is to be uh, changed, to be different, or rather to be formed like the world. But the word transformed, however, is telling us to be different. To be like that fake vase. The word transformed comes from a Greek word metamorphosis. And you can see what our word metamorphosis comes from then. The word metamorphosis, of course, means change. You ever read Franz Kafka's Metamorphosis? That's what that book's all about. But a man who's transformed now, he's changed from a person into a cockroach. <laughs> but we have a metamorphosis. We change. The Bible tells us here that we go as an unshaken lump, a person who is out here in this world, a person without direction, a person who has sin in their life. And what they do is, is they allow God to take hold of them, and to shape them, and to mold them, and to transform them from this old person that they once were over to this new individual that he wants us to be in our lives. Paul says in, in Galatians 4, verse 19, in that verse, toward the end of the verse, Paul uses the phrase, uh, as he talks about how he's lamenting over the Galatians and he's concerned for them, he uses the phrase, till Christ is formed in you. You see, the mold that we're trying to reach in our lives isn't some kind of shape that we might put in a, in, in a cookie cutter or, or some kind of vase. But the shape we're trying to come out like is Jesus. That's the mold we're trying to, to mimic in our lives. And so the Bible says in Colossians 3, verse 9 and verse 10, in regards to who we used to be and who we are now, he says in, in Colossians 3, verse 10, and have uh, put off, or rather, and put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Verse 10. Verse 9 says we put off the old man. But verse 10 uses the idea of renewing our mind. Remember what he says here. The renewing of your mind. He's talking about our inner person. It's not that we're trying to look like Jesus on the outside from the standpoint that we have the same eye color or hair color that he had or, or, or whatever. But it's who we're trying to be on the inside. Which is a reflection of who we, how we behave on the outside. But he says that happens by the renewing of your mind. And again, that's why I go back to the idea of taking God's Word and molding ourselves after His Word and coming out the other side, the new man, who's made in the image of Him. When you take something that is like this, and it comes out the other side shaped like something else, it's like the image that you had up here in your head. When Michelangelo chipped away the marble. And, and chipped away all the, the pieces that maybe had made the marble look square and rigid until it came out and looked like a beautiful sculpture. He had that up here in his head, in his mind, and he was thinking about how he wanted it to look. We have the mind of Christ. And in his mind, he has an image that he wants each and every one of us to come out like. And we make that choice to allow him to sculpt us, to allow him to make us into that individual that he wants us to be. And you know what that is? That's a process. It's a process just like the sculptor takes when he sets, a, sets some clay down on a wheel and he's, and he's shaping whatever that is. It's a process. Paul said over in Philippians chapter 3, and verse 12, 
specifically, 12 through 16, you want to read that sometime. Verse 16, he says, or verse 12, he says, Not that I have already attained or am already perfected. In other words, he is not already <coughs> shapen. Like sometimes we say that. But I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has laid hold of me. If you could follow the analogy that we've been talking about this morning about the potter and us being the clay, imagine in your mind, Christ has laid hold upon you. And through his word, he is shaping you into something, something far more uh, important, something far more valuable, something far more useful than you used to be, but it's not an overnight kind of thing. It takes time for the sculpture to make this sculpture. It takes time for the sculpture to, to get that shape in the sculpture that he wants. I don't know how long it took Michelangelo to, to make the various different things he made, but I'm certain it wasn't an overnight thing. Any more than it is an overnight thing for God to take us this raw individual who is a new creature in Christ when we come out of the uh, water grave of baptism to be that person that he wants us to be when we get to uh, the end of our life. It comes into form as time. Like the picture here on the board, I don't know if you can see that really well, but this picture here, uh, at some point in time, this picture would have looked uh, a lot less reformed and refined as it does here. And by the time it's finished, you might that potter may come up with a nice looking vase or a nice looking cup but it was something that it took that took shape over time just as that lump of clay starts out as that lump and it's shaped over time we started out as that as well and if we let God shape us he can do so and it's a lifetime thing that's why Paul says in verse 13 he reaches he moves forward reaching for that which Christ has uh, waiting for him now it's a process but what else is it it's a process with a purpose. God doesn't just tell us about how he can shape us for no reason any more than a potter makes something for no reason. You know, they might make something for decoration. They might make something to be used in the kitchen as a cup or whatever. They might make a statue like uh, Michelangelo did. They might make a painting or a fresco or something along those lines to add beauty to a building or whatever. God has a purpose. I think sometimes we go through life, especially those who've never obeyed the gospel again, and we think to ourselves, I don't know what my purpose in life is. I don't know why I'm here. Well, let me tell you something. God has a purpose for every single one of us. In God's mind, His Word, there's an image that He wants every single one of us to come out on the other end looking like. Notice what the Bible says here over in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 20. But in a great house... There are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. And so here he uses another analogy like Jeremiah 18 did when it used the idea of a potter. Paul tells us here that when you go into somebody's house, and you'll, you'll see various different things, maybe on their shelves. You'll see vases. You'll see uh, pictures. You'll see little mini statues or whatever. And some of these things are there to add uh, an aesthetic, uh, positive aesthetic to the place. Some of them, perhaps not so much. In our lives, those vessels of dishonor that he talks about, there would be sin in our lives, the misbehavior in our lives. And Paul here says that in these houses where there are things that are made of silver and gold and some of wood and clay, some of these things that would be the dishonorable things, the, the sin, the wickedness in our life, the ungodliness that we live, those are things, he says, that if we cleanse ourselves from the latter, we will be a vessel for honor. Now a vessel would be something that a potter took and they, they molded it and it became something that was useful. In this case, then, we think about what is my purpose in life. My purpose in life, your purpose in life, is to be someone who has cleansed themselves from the things of this life. You don't believe that <coughs> baptized shall be saved and raised to walk in the newness of life, walking in the service of the Lord. He has set us apart. We are sanctified. We are different from this world. He has transformed us. He has translated us out of the power of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. And he says here, we are then useful. You mean if I don't let the potter mold me and shape me after his will while I'm waiting, I'm not going to be useful to him. And so if I let him shape me, I can be useful for him. For who? For the master pre 
prepared for every good work. You see, yeah, there's a purpose you have in life. God has a purpose for every one of us. And the, at the end, that purpose is, is to serve Him, to be doers of His Word, and to give Him glory in everything that we do. But He shapes us to be that individual. He has a purpose for us. He's the Master. And He's prepared us for every good work. Now, where are those works at? Well, those works are in the mold. They're in this book that we call Bible. That's so all we got to do is pick it up, study it, and learn it. And we can find ourselves shaping Shaping in the image of his son as we go through this life. And we strive to be more and more like Jesus. Now, as we bring our lesson to a close this morning, I'm reminded of what Paul says in the book of Ephesians. Again, think about what is my purpose in life? Why am I here? What am I supposed to do in this life? Well, aside from the scriptures we just read, think about what the Apostle Paul said in the book of Ephesians. Mirrors what we read a moment ago in the book of Colossians. When he says that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt to the deceitful lust and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Last night, Angie and the girls, and well, they wrangled me into doing it too, were making ornaments. And what they did is they took some flour and they took some dough uh, and they put it together, made a little round ball out of it, and did all the things they needed to do to lay it down flat on the table. And they took various different shapes, and they'd stick on that, on, that, on that flat surface, and it would come out as a shape. And then we would peel away from those shapes all the parts that, that didn't need to be there, all the excess that was there. You see, you want to find your purpose in life, and you want to... You want to be shaping the way God wants you to be shaping. What we need to do is we need to take away all the excesses in this life. We need to take away all the things that will take our attention away from God and allow God to be the central focus of our lives. You see on that table there, that little cup is at the center. And if that cup could look up, it would look up and it would see the potter. We need to be right in God's hands. Letting God mold us and make us you know, the kind of people he has us be. That's what discipleship's all about. When we come out the other end as people who are serving God and we're doing things based upon the purpose that he's created us for. Maybe you're here this morning, you're not a Christian. You know, you can find purpose in your life by becoming one, by serving God, by allowing the potter to shape you and to mold you and to make you after his will. And it starts by humbly submitting to him in faith, having faith that, yes, I want God to mold me. Yes, I know that his way is the right way. It is the best way. As you've heard his word, we hope you will believe it and repent of your sins. Luke 13, 3 says, I tell you nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish, that you will confess Jesus to be the Son of God. Romans 10, 10. The heart man believes unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And then be baptized into Christ. For the remission of your sins, Acts 2, verse 38 says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Maybe you've done that and you've fallen away. You need to get back in the hands of the potter. Let him finish the work that he started in your life. You can come back to God through repentance and prayer. We'll pray with you and for you. Whatever need is this morning, let it be known as we stand, as we sing the invitation song. Would you be free from your burden?